and I think I might be the only one who remembers the 60s. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I can make up any story I want and everybody believes me. <laughs> There's no contradictions. Um, we had just gone separate ways. It's like getting married when you're 14 and 18. Suddenly you're 23 and 24 and you go, who's this woman I married to? And she's yeah. saying, who's this guy? You know what I mean? It's like we had started as mid-teenagers, gone to England, gone broke, gone bankrupt, had wonderful experiences. And uh, basically what brought it on was I had a medical problem. And anybody out there who's had a gallstone or a kidney stone, I had gallstones. I had gallbladder problem. And so every night on the road, an American woman has hit number one. We've gone from $750 a night. Yeah to 10,000 a night. That's a big jump. Yeah. Wow. And suddenly from wow. being in the hole making 750 a night and ahead a month away is like 10,000 a night with Creighton's clear water and stuff like that. I'm going to the hospital every night throwing up blood this pain in my chest, and I don't know what it is. It's like a knife turning right there. I would literally turn a chair upside down, take the leg of the chair, and just push it in there on my gallbladder. I didn't know what it was. Yeah. Horrific amount of pain, and you're in a cold, hot and cold sweat, and you don't know what it is, and you think you're dying. Mm -hmm. And once is okay. When it happens every night for two or three weeks, it's time to go home and see your doctor. Yep. And I would have our road manager, Jim Martin, who lives here in Toronto, he works at Sony, uh, take me to the emergency every single night. And they'd say, well, have, bring him in in the morning and we'll, have some, we'll do some more tests. And he'd say, well, we're, we're leaving in the morning. We're going to Cleveland. We're leaving in the morning. We're going to Pittsburgh. We're leaving the next morning. We were in a different place. I couldn't get any medical attention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Finally, I said to the band, look, I got to go home. I think I'm dying. I don't know what's wrong with me. Nobody could diagnose me. Nobody, I wasn't anywhere long enough. We're just every single night. And so... Um, there was a, uh, this is an amazing thing, I don't even know if it's in any book. We played um, Westchester, Pennsylvania, which is just outside of uh, Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. It's a room very similar to this, and the stage is only that high. After this particular gig, we actually have a week off, like six days off, and then the next big weekend, I cut two more gigs, and then a week off, and then the Fillmore East in New York. I mean, this uh, is huge right. antic for mm -hmm. guys from Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. So, I have that last attack, but... I go and play that gig that night, and a band comes. You could tell a band, they all, the drummer's watching the drummer, the guitar player's standing in front of me. You know, everybody's watching. I take binoculars and see where they played the solo and write down. The solo was on the fifth fret, and I'd count it and write it down. I'd go home and stay up all night trying to figure out the solo, because right. there was no videos or music yeah. in those days. And uh, this guy's right in front of me, and his name is Bobby, and he said, uh, my dad's in construction. I have a big basement, and this is our band. We practice in my basement. We've got a Hammond organ and a PA all set up, and do you want to come to a party later, and blah, 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 and uh, we know every one of your songs. We play your songs, except I don't know She's Come Undone. Can you show me the chords? Because he didn't know the, the Lenny Bro jazz chords, so She's Come Undone. So I say, okay. So I, later at, that night at his house, I'm uh, teaching him the She's Come Undone, and after the party, I go back to my room, and true to form, I have a gallbladder attack at 2 or 3 in the morning, and J uh -huh. Jim Martin takes me to the hospital, and they say, look, if this has happened to you 14 times, you've got to go, where do, you, where do you live, Winnipeg? Well, go back to your doctor. Mm -hmm. So we had that week off, so I went to the band, so I've got to go home to Dr. Lerner in Winnipeg, the guy who birthed me into the world, and see what's wrong with me. I, I don't know what's wrong with me. I think I'm dying. It's just terrible. And... Uh, they say, so what do we do next week? And I said, well, that whole, that band knows every one of our songs. And Bobby Sabellico, I taught Undone, he knows everything else. I'll just hire him to play with you. It's two gigs, and then there's another eight days off. And then I'll come back, and whatever I've got to do, if I've got to throw up blood before, and I did, yeah. at the Fillmore in the bathroom, go on stage and play. Wow. So uh, I teach this guy the songs. I pay him a couple of hundred bucks. By then, it's, we're making 10000 night. Bob Sabellico plays, I think, four gigs with the Guess Who. I come back, play the Fillmore East. That was my last gig with them. It was May of 1970. And we rocked the Fillmore. I'll and bet. we didn't want to do These Eyes because it was the ultimate bubblegum song. Yeah. So we started with the heavy stuff, doing Friends of Mine and all the acid rock. And I'm playing with a drumstick and Burton's doing the flute and we're being real hip and cool. And we keep getting called back for encore after encore after encore. And this is the Fillmore East and it's full of hippies and they're all blasted and you know everybody's <laughs> stoned and everything. And... We finally go out on stage, and Burton says, we have nothing left to play. And they yell out, play these eyes. And it's like 2.30 in the morning, and we start to go, bum, bum. And everybody starts crying. They put their arms around each of yeah. their partners, and it's like kumbaya at the Fillmore. Oh, yeah. And they're all singing, these eyes, crying. And we go, wow, this is really a hit. If the hippies love this, all the stoners yeah. there love this song. Yeah. 
Uh, so that was my last gig with them, and, and uh, I had to sort out a whole bunch of stuff. Went back to Winnipeg, saw my doctor, treated the gallbladder with diet and stuff like that, and then had a, two restless, restless years of wanting to do something else. And I started another band that evolved again from uh, with Chad Allen. Started with yeah, Chad Allen yeah, again, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then though, as right? we got near success, he pulled out. He's like kind of afraid of the because um, when you're successful, there's a commitment. Yeah. I'm going to give mm -hmm. you a job. You got to write every single night, and you got to every concert, whether you like it or not, and do me a review for the next morning. And you yeah. got to have it in by one o'clock, so it's in the paper the yeah. next day. And they, your job, your boss tells you that's the same with us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a hit. You got to go on the road and work and play it. Because if you don't go out and work and play, it, we're not going to promote it because nobody will buy your record. Blah blah. So you get into the cycle. So Chad Allen would kind of uh, shy away from all that. So the band I started with him, which was kind of country rock thing, um, evolved to getting Fred Turner in the band and. Um, we changed our name to Backman Turner, and they thought we were a folk band for a while. Yeah. Because of like Brewer and Shipley and uh, Seals and Crofts, and they thought we're, we're playing coffee houses, and we're showing up playing this rock and roll music, and Fred's got a voice like a gravel truck. And we're blowing, you know, cups off the table in coffee houses <laughs> like this, and they said, you need a name to show you play heavy music, that you're not a folk duo like Seals and Crofts. And we saw a Trucker's Magazine called Overdrive. Yeah. And I wrote it down on a napkin. You know how napkins are tall in the trucks, those chrome things? So I wrote down Backman, and there's no room to write beside it. Couldn't write on the napkin, long way. So I wrote Backman and under it, Turner, under it, Overdrive. And I called the head of the label the next morning and said, I've got a new name. Yeah. Backman Turner Overdrive. And he goes, wow, phenomenal. No one's ever used that word, Overdrive, in music before. But it's too long. And I look at the napkin, and it's got BTO, and I go... How about BTO? And he goes, wow, ka-ching. That's like Chicago then was Chicago Transit Authority, right. CTA. Yes. Crosby, Sills, and Nash being called CSN. Uh, and yeah. he goes, wow, you've got a logo. And the, get an overdrive gear like from a Ferrari and do that whole thing. And suddenly we, this thing just fell. It happened to us. It was right. amazing. Well, I think there was ELO and ELP. And as yeah. Homer Simpson said when you appeared on the Yeah, Simpsons, all the we, bands with the initials. Yeah, yeah. ELO, <laughs> ELP. Because yeah. we were busy in the 70s. Yeah. We didn't have a lot yeah. of time. Um, but the interesting thing about Brave Belt is, is that it starts out as, 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 as I, a really interesting actually country rock outfit, yeah. but it doesn't, it doesn't connect commercially. And then a song called, I guess it's Give Me Your Money Please is the first song that is an indication of what is to come, right? How do you get to that? How do you become like the ultimate blue collar oh. rock band? Well, Neil Young had come back and played us many uh, demos of him and the Buffalo Springfield and this other band called Poco and all this new country rock thing going yeah, on with Jim yeah. McGuinn and the Birds. And we had played the Seattle Pop Festival in 1969 with the new Birds and the Burrito Brothers and all that stuff. And I thought, whatever I do, because I've left a band that's number one in the world, album and single, whatever I do is going to be second best, okay? So rather than being second best, I'd rather be last. But doing, not trying to copy them, I can never get a better singer than yeah, Burton yeah. Cummings. Mm -hmm. I can get a different singer who's as good, but never get one in that music I was writing at the time, real good pop, Beatle kind of, Beach Boy kind of music. So we started to play country music. We went on tour with Tommy Hunter. Remember Tommy Hunter? And remember King Ganim, the fiddle player and all yeah. that stuff? Yeah. And we started to do country shows. We got airplay and... Um, it just wasn't us. We were playing too loud. We were too too much like Creedence Clear. Once Fred Turner was in the band, he's got, the, like I said, this the cement truck. Amazing. Where I'm delivering the cement. If you're in the way, I'm driving <laughs> over your face. That's how he sings, you know? So I hope you enjoy cement. Because, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You ordered it, it's coming, you know? <laughs> and uh, so we, and, and there's a very pivotal gig we had. It was in Thunder Bay, and we just played Thunder Bay and told the story, and people were in tears, because they all remember it. Right. They remember when I used to go with the guests who and play the gardens there, and 12-year-old Paul Schaefer was in the front row, and he'd come talk to us, and Burton Cummings about the keyboard and all that kind of stuff. And so... Um, we go and play Thunder Bay at Lakehead University, and it's at the end of the season, and it's basketball games. So they got to play games on Friday night, and we play Friday night in the cafeteria, which is much like this. And then the next night's the next playoff, and we play again the Saturday night. So we go and play the Friday night. They win the game, so which means they're going to play again the next night, and there's another team playing against them. And we go and play the cafeteria, and we start our country rock kind of stuff, and the audience looks like this. They're just sitting there like this. <laughs> And nobody, I mean, they want them to dance. I mean, it's a dance. Do you know what I mean? It's not a sit. It's a dance. <laughs> and uh, the guy who uh, was promoting us then was a guy named Mike Tilka, who ended up being the bass player in, uh, what was Kim Mitchell's first band? Max Webster. Webster, yeah. And so Mike Tilka comes to us. And he's a musician. He's got long hair, and he looks like William Shakespeare kind of thing. And uh, he says, I've got some bad news for you guys. 
you were out, you you didn't make it tonight nobody was dancing everybody complained you didn't play really good music so i have to let you go i can't even pay you there was not enough money that came in the door everybody left and asked for their money back so just leave your gear here come back in the morning come back saturday morning pack up your gear and go back to winnipeg so we went and slept in the car uh because we couldn't afford a hotel and uh, all we could afford was a bucket of chicken from Jean's Kentucky Fried Chicken there. And we slept in the car and uh, in the parking lot. And uh, we went in the next morning at about 10, 30, 11 to pack up our gear. And he was going to call the agency back in Toronto and get another band. And uh, he comes up and he says, um, don't pack up your stuff yet. Surely you could play some music that people can dance to. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I can't get another band for tonight. <laughs> I said, so what are you saying, Mike? He said, if you guys can put together two sets of dance tunes and do three sets, I'll pay you for last night and pay you for tonight. Tonight's the big night, and if they win, it's going to be a big celebration. And uh, you have all afternoon, your gear's here, and they're playing games now, and they'll be coming in here about 7 o'clock. So I sat down with Fred Turner and said, what can you sing? And he said, Proud Mary, all the credence, Proud Mary, Brown Sugar, Jumpy Jack Flash. I said, great, I could sing bad guys like Dylan and Neil Young, and, and you know, I'll fill in in between you, and we'll play some instrumentals. We put together two sets. And then the third set is, by request, we played this in the first set, we're going to play it again. The third set was a mixture of the other two sets, and we got paid 800, 400 a night, 800 bucks, went home. That night changed, Bray Belt became back in Toronto. We had this music, we needed, knew we needed to change our name, and we did, and I told you how we changed our name, we got it from the Truckers uh, Magazine, Overdrive. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and when it came to um, writing the hits, um, pile-driving, truck-themed hits that BTO became known for, Tell me a little bit about that songwriting process and how different that was from writing with Burton Cummings. And then, actually, in a few minutes, what we'll, if you folks want to get ready with your with your questions, we'll be turning it over to uh, to uh, to you guys. Well, the man who signed uh, BTO back when Turnover Drive name was Charlie Fash, and he was uh, the head of Mercury Records. When he signed us, we I had 26 refusals from 26, right. maybe a 20 record labels. Some had refused us twice over a period of two years because a, a guy got fired, a new guy went in, I'd resubmit. Yeah. <laughs> I used to love this thing called executive turntable and billboard. Who's left this position? Who's moved in? I would send them both at their new jobs, even though they passed earlier. You need a rock band? Here's our, here's our new CD. I mean, here's our new tape. We didn't have CDs then. And um, it was just kind of amazing, the evolution there. Um, so the, our, the deal was built on me, my songwriting, because he knew I could write songs. That's why he wanted my name. He didn't want Bray Belt on record. He wanted Backman there. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple of my brothers in the band, so it was yeah, like right. Backman, and yeah. then put Turner in. And so, because, because it all boils down to DJ recognition. They recognize your name, they're bound to play it, and even if they don't like it, they've at least played it. It's just, they're just not throwing it away, because they get so many records and submissions. So that's what we were, uh, it was based on me, so I figured, I'm not that great a writer, because I'd written most of my stuff with Burton Cummings. Once in a while I wrote, like, She's Come Undone, or No Sugar Alone, and he'd write a song alone, but basically where we were like a Lennon and McCartney or Jagger and Richards. And I found it very hard to write alone for the first time, so uh, being the genius I was, <laughs> I said to the other guys in the band, try to write some songs and bring them to me and I'll help you shape them and f form them to songs. Because I, hmm? I don't want to write every song, in the, I don't want 12 of the same songs. I mean, Chuck Berry had the same song 12 times on every album. Yep. They were good because he had, was a great lyricist, they all told a different story, but it was the same music underneath. Um, so I, the other guys would write and I would bring them in and, and I... I wanted to copy horn sections, so if you hear a song like Give Me Your Money, Please, I'm playing horn sections, like... Yeah. Dot, yeah. dot, like yeah. the big horn, like right. Little yeah. Richard kind yeah. of yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. Just playing the chords, dot, dot, and that kind of thing. And so, besides playing rhythm and lead, I'd always do... Taking care of business. Da, 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 yeah, da, sure. That kind yeah, of thing. So mm -hmm. I'm actually playing that on guitar for maybe the first time. Yeah. Um, and, and kind of getting away with it and reinforcing it by doubling it. And I almost created like a new texture because Credence was all mm -hmm. straight rhythm thing. And I was going, I, if I'd play that, I'd go. Left a good job in the city. Like real, yep. like Fred, instead of going, left a good job in Right. that kind of difference driving, between us yeah. more driving yeah. and we looked at what made people dance yeah 
Nothing got them up like brown sugar or jumping jack flash. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That kind of thing. So that's what we, we kind of went after primitive tribal beat rock and roll. My brother was not a great drummer. He yeah. grew up playing oatmeal boxes. I made him his first drum set <laughs> out of those round oatmeal things. Yeah, and I would sure. cut one off so it'd be smaller than the other and put the lid on. Yeah. And he played with wooden spoons. So all I could tell him was just play like this. Boom, 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 ching, boom, 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 ching, boom. And that's how he played on most of the records. Yeah. But on all of them, actually. <laughs> um, but it formed a beat that was very identifiable. And I've had people come, like great musicians, like Jim Valance, who wrote yeah, all Brian's hits, yeah. come and say, your brother Robbie was like one of the greatest drummers in rock because <laughs> he was an animal. He just played, he was like Animal and Muppets, the same thing yeah. over and over, right? <laughs> the same thing over and over and over, you know? It was like that kind of thing, so. We have, uh, um, there's so much more to talk about. You know, you should get a radio show because you were just like, <laughs> So good at this. You mean um, a job? Yeah, job. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Uh, working for the man. If you um, would, it, <laughs> there. You want me to sing? Uh, they're asking one of us to sing, and I don't think it's me. Okay, I'll I'll uh, I'll tell you a story how I wrote a song, and then I'll play you a little bit of the song. Okay. I don't know if you remember, um, there's a couple of guys here my age. Um, the late 60s was a CBC show called Let's Go and Music Hop, and the guests who were on every single week, uh, it was on every day of the week. Uh, like one day would be from Halifax, that's where Anne Murray started, then it would be Ottawa, then it would be Toronto, and the, the host in Toronto was Alex Trebek, I mean he was the DJ, and the bands would be, you know, guys that became Lighthouse and things like that, and from Winnipeg was us, and from Vancouver was Susan and Cher Terry Jackson, everybody went on to have hit records after that show, but we were on it every week from Winnipeg. And we wanted to be like the Beatles, so we had a pink, remember that first Beatles album where they're all looking down um, like a stairway down and somebody's shooting yeah. a picture at them? They had on pink button-down shirts, uh, burgundy sparkle suits, and burgundy sparkle ties. So we would wear these on TV, even though it was black and white. <laughs> <laughs> We'd wear them on TV. And, and uh, as people grew up and left Winnipeg, and most of them did, there's a lot of great people famous from Winnipeg. Uh, a lot of them are friends of ours who were friends back in Winnipeg. And Daryl Burlingham, who's also in Toronto, known as Daryl B., was in Vancouver at that time. And he called up and he said, because you're on TV every week, the, the kids, you have a little following, and I'm playing your records, and they know a couple of your records. I want you to come and be on a show. You'll open the show. The headlines are Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Inventions. And he's just discovered another band called Alice Cooper. It's a bunch of guys who dress up like chicks. And you're going to be the opening act. <laughs> so we showed up with our burgundy suits <laughs> and pink button-down shirts. And we were the freaks because we were so straight. We looked like four businessmen because the Beatles dressed like businessmen. They had shirts and ties and the Stones dressed all shabby and bad boys. But Frank Zappa and the mothers, they, I mean, they had like, they're wearing baby diapers on their heads and boas and, and, and the most incredible, on, these are on airplanes they're wearing this stuff. And Alice Cooper wearing tights and lipstick and all that stuff. And so I've known these guys for that time. So we played Vancouver, Seattle, Portland, and San Francisco. Couldn't wait to get from San Francisco. As a kid in Winnipeg growing up, I'd heard about a hippie. Like, what, there's no hippies in Winnipeg, it's freezing. <laughs> These are kids without shirts on, you know, playing guitars with a peace sign on saying make love not war. And they're basically really affected by the Vietnam War and we're not in Winnipeg. Um, so I'm walking down where B uh, Berkeley is, uh, the University of California, they're down Telegraph Avenue. I'm walking down Telegraph Avenue and uh, we've gone into the record stores there because there's just tons of record stores on that avenue because it's right at the foot of university. And I'm buying vinyl. And I'm buying like Neil Young bootlegs and Beatle bootlegs and stuff. And I'm carrying all these vinyls around. I'm going to my car to put it in the trunk. And as I walk down the street, there's three guys coming towards me down the street. And they're probably like as far away as that back exit sign there. Good couple hundred feet. And they've got leather jackets on and tattoos and chains. And they, they look like, when you're all alone, three guys together in leather, is, it's a biker gang, okay? <laughs> I'm looking at these guys, and you're also told when you're an American, I mean, when you're Canadian, you're touring the States, this is the late 60s, <coughs> never, ever get in a fight with an American guy. They're all drafted at 17, they're taught hand-to-hand -hand, hand -hand combat, they could kill with their baby finger, and unless you're on skates with a hockey stick, you can't fight, okay? <laughs> <laughs> 
So I, these three guys are coming towards me. All this is flashing in my mind. Get away from these guys. Don't get in a fight with these guys. Be nice to them. Avoid them. So I go over and pretend I'm looking in a window. And the three of them walk, come to my side of the street. And they're glaring at me. They're giving me this look like, we're going to rip you apart. And so I nonchalantly try to walk across the street, pretending I'm window shopping. And I, <laughs> I walk across the street to this side to pretend I'm looking in the window. And they come to my side of the street, and they're getting closer and closer to me. And as they get up to about like where that microphone is, like a couple of, you know, 50, 30, 40 feet, the three of them are glaring at me. I figure, what am I going to do now? And up pulls a little brown, remember those Ford Pintos, those weird little cars? Yeah, up pulls yeah. a little brown Pinto or something with a blue door and a smashed, uh, you know, window to, held together with scotch tape and stuff, and they're like really a poor car. And out of it, it gets a little small Mexican woman about five feet tall. And these guys are like Mexican, one's Mexican, one's black, and one's white, and they're big macho, three guys giving me this glare. And she pulls over the car and starts yelling at them, and I go, Whew, wow, great. She starts yelling at them, and two of them leave, and leave this one guy behind, who obviously is the man in her life. <laughs> And she says to him, you no good bum, you're out checking out the chicks with your buddies, walking down the street, you're supposed to be looking for a job, you didn't take out the garbage when you left, blah, 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 get in the car. So he looks, he shrugs and looks at me, so suddenly Mr. Macho and his buddies are gone, he's shrugging, going, gee, I'm henpecked, and she's, he gets in the car and she slams the door and she says, furthermore, baby, when you get home, you ain't getting no sugar tonight. <laughs> Deep inside, find a corner where I can hide. Silent footsteps crowding me, flooding darkness, but I can see. Sugar tonight in my coffee, no sugar tonight in my tea. Sugar to stand beside me, no sugar to run with me. Thank you. <clears throat> so a lot of the inspiration for the songs came from moments like that, and I go, wow, what a title. And when I wrote that song, it was quite racy. Mm -hmm. yeah, because I knew what No Sugar Night Tonight meant, that guy, what he wasn't going to get that right. night. Yep. Yep. Uh, mm, yep. But when I played it for the record label, they said, oh, you can't put this out, it'll be banned. I said, great, we want it to be banned, because everything banned would get played. Yeah. They said, no, you got to change it. So it became No Sugar Tonight in My Coffee, No Sugar Tonight in My Tea. And that was a number one uh, twin single with American Woman's double A side. Yeah. And I'd written it alone, so that was like a big deal for me. Tell us how American Woman came about. Uh, we had crossed the border from Winnipeg and we were going to play, uh, see Winnipeg, besides being the center of Canada, it's also the center of nowhere. Right. <laughs> You've got to drive yeah. hundreds of miles to get anywhere. Consequently, that's why the music scene is so good that you stay there. Dead center there. of the continent, isn't it? Dead center, yeah, right, right, yeah, right yeah, in the middle of North American yeah, continent. Yeah. So we had a gig in Texas to play a grad. It was $400. So we thought, what the heck? So you imagine driving from Winnipeg down to Texas, Tyler, Texas. And I figured, I'm going to see Buddy Holly there. I'm going to see Buddy Knox there. Roy Orbison, you know. Yeah. Naive, you think they're all going to be there waiting for you to show up. So we would cross the border. We had something then called green cards, which meant you could work in the United States. And we'd cross the border, and gas was cheaper then in, in North Dakota than, than it was in Canada. We'd cross the border, and I always go to a gas station and fill up our tank. And uh, the guy w was an old farmer. One of these tanks was like a glass tube, and you got glass by like the inch. It right. was not a meter, like when you see it go down. And uh, he'd always say, so where are you boys going this time? And we said, we're going to Washington, D.C. to play. We're going to San Francisco to play with Joan Baez. We're going to Boston to play with, you know, Richie Havens or something. And he said, where are you going this time? We say, Texas. And uh, we're going out to play a graduation in Tyler, Texas. And said, but first, the guy at the border said to go in some building, a white building that's called Selective Service. And I think, I don't know what that means. And he said, you don't know what Selective Service means? You're really a Canadian. <laughs> I said, what does it mean? He said, it's the draft board. And he said, you got green cards? And I said, yeah. He said, you don't want to go in there. They will actually physically take you and put you in handcuffs. You'll be in a uniform. You'll be gone. They took my son a year and a half ago. He was just killed in Vietnam. They've now taken my nephew out of college. He's 18. They sent him over there. We're just, we're all upset. We all want to like run to Canada. 
do yourselves a favor. Don't go to Texas, because they'll, they'll come and find you. You've got your green cards. Turn left here, drive over, turn left again, go up through Duluth, go back to Canada. Turn in your green cards at the border. Don't come back till the war's over. We don't go to Tyler, Texas. <laughs> we don't get the 400 bucks. Yeah. We turn left and turn left. We're suddenly in, uh, across the border at Duluth. We're in Toronto, and I phone the agency in, in Toronto and say, uh, hi, this is Randy Backman from the Guess Who. Uh, we, need a couple, we need a gig or two, and um, can you get us a gig? And he said, well, for when? And I said, tonight. <laughs> this is on a Saturday morning. And um, he said, amazing. This is just amazing. I just had a band called Little Caesar and the Consuls cancel because somebody lost his voice, and we need a band to play Kitchener Waterloo, the, the curling rink there. I said, how much does it pay? He said, 400 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> We're there. <laughs> so we went there to play Kitchener Water. It was a typical dance, which is like three hours, and they put the plywood on the ice, and everybody comes in their parkas and rubber boots. And, and they're there playing toques and everything. And so we're sitting there playing, and um, I broke a string. And then I had one guitar, no tech, no tuner, nothing, just one guitar. So I broke a string, Burton said to the, the kid, the audience, uh, Randy's got to change a string, we're going to take a break, and we'll be back in like 10 minutes. So they all leave the stage. I'm on the stage tuning out my guitar, putting on a string, and I'm kneeling in front of the piano. It's kind of dark. We have two little lights. And I'm kneeling, kneeling in front of the piano to tune to the piano. So I'm going bong, 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 bong. And I'm tuning up my guitar. And the band is now interspersed talking to the audience because we kind of know the kids. We played Canada many, many times, all these schools and curling. So everybody, we have friends everywhere. The band is all talking. Burton Cummings is at the back door of the arena. It's one of these beautiful winter nights where the, it's a full moon and you can kind of see, you can read a book outside when it's reflecting off of the snow. Yeah. It's just phenomenal. And I see Burton out there doing some, something with a guy in the trunk of his car. <laughs> He's buying something. <laughs> he later said he was buying comic books, but who knows what. So I'm tuning the guitar, and as I get to this, I'm going to yeah, start. My guitar's in tune, and as I look up, all the heads in the audience have gone to look at me. This is like the beginning to a whole lot of love. It's like, hey. do -da, do -da, do -da. it's yeah. like that kind of thing, and I go, oh, my, I can't forget this. So I've got to keep playing it. So I keep playing it, and I look into the audience, and I see Jim Cale. Yeah. The bass when I go like this, like, get up on stage, he comes up and he says, just play this with me. Then we get Gary Peterson up, and we play the song for four or five minutes, and Burton looks in, he sees that it's us on stage, because records were being played then, and he comes up on stage, and he says, what is this? What are we doing? And I said, I don't want to forget this riff, and I'm yelling this to him while I'm playing it on stage, play something. So he plays a flute solo, because he played flute in the odd song, he plays a harmonica solo, he plays a piano solo, finally I yell to him, sing something. And he's, he said, what, like what? Because <laughs> it, it was not a blues. I mean, a blues, all you got to do is start is, woke up this morning. That starts yeah, every yeah, blues, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. But because of the, the threat of being uh, almost drafted and being sent over there against our own will to fight in the jungles of Vietnam, and, and seeing all the posters, Uncle Sam wants you, remember the poster with the, the stars mm -hmm. and stripe hat, mm -hmm. and the Statue of Liberty, the statue wants you, fight for liberty and stuff. Mm -hmm. Out of his mouth, when I said, sing anything, he just screamed out, American woman, stay away from me. He did that four times. I soloed, he did it four times. I soloed, the song was over. We remembered the song. That's, sometimes your lyric helps you remember the lyric. Like McCartney, uh, yesterday was first called Scrambled Eggs, because that's what made him go, scrambled eggs. Da, da, da. Oh, my baby, I really love your legs. Did you ever yeah. see him do that with Jimmy yeah. Fallon? Yeah. That was yeah. great. But that's how you remember a song, is get funny lyrics to it, and you can recall the funny lyrics. Um, and the next day we were to do that song again, Burton said, I've got some lyrics to add in. I'm like, War Machines and Ghetto Scenes. And I said, great, add it in. So we just, we did the song like that. And finally we played it for Jack Richardson, who was our producer. And he said, that song's great. Let's count it in and do it. We counted it in. We couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. We couldn't, we didn't know how to do it. We had, it was not really a formal song. And we tried it over and over. And finally Jack said, okay, let's take a break. And Randy, I want you to start it alone, just like you did on stage at Kitchener Waterloo. So I go out, and I, and I got my Les Paul, and I, I tune up the guitar, and I start again, and then Gary starts playing drums, and then Jim comes in, and suddenly we get the groove, because it had to come from nowhere. And then Burton comes out and sings the track, I overdub a guitar. He says this is going to be a, a career record, and they release it, and it goes to number one. And that store, that um, um, curling rink, is now at True Value Hardware in Kitchener-Waterloo. <laughs>
Wow. There's a spot on the floor that says American Woman was written here. Yeah, it was written right here. And that was recently voted, the, I think, the top song in Canada of all time and the number one best. I, I believe it. Yeah. No, I believe it. Absolutely, it is. It is.